Two nights ago, Michael Wilson, our honorary president, presented Ed Batinsky with this year's Master of Photography Award. Um, and we are delighted that he's going to be speaking with uh, Bill Ewing this afternoon. Um, those of you who have seen his show here will know what an extraordinary artist Ed is. Those of you who haven't seen his show should leave immediately and go and look at it and then come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm thrilled that we were able to make the pres this presentation to Ed. I'm also thrilled that Bill, who not only curates our um, exhibition program, but is a prodigious uh, exhibition curator and writer, and has probably written more words on Ed Patinsky than anybody else living. I'm not sure if that's true or not, oh, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I can't really think of anyone better to have this conversation to illustrate and um, to pull out some of the detail of this, of the career of this exemplary artist. Thank you both for doing this. Thank you all for coming. I look forward to a very interesting conversation. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I can think of lots of people who could do it better than I would. But no, not at you're, all, Bill. You're stuck with me. So. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to start with something a little formal, just to put Ed in, Ed, Ed in perspective. Some of you are, uh, know his work intimately, I think, by now. Uh, he's had a tremendous presence over the last 20 years. Uh, extremely well published, extremely well exhibited, but some of you I know from um, previous uh, talks here, even today, come out of curiosity and not knowing too much and would like a kind of um, general statement. So here, here's a more formal statement here. So he, Ed Brutinsky is, is clearly one of Canada's most respected contemporary photographers. His remarkable photographic depiction of global industrial landscapes, sometimes called industrial sublime, are included in the collections of over 60 museums, major museums around the world, including the National Gallery of Canada, Museum of Modern Art, Guggenheim Museum in New York, Reina Sofia in Madrid, Tate Modern in London, Los Angeles County Museum, and so on. His distinctions include the TED Prize, the Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts, the Outreach Award at the Rencontre d'Al, the Roloff Benny Book Award, and the Rogers Best Canadian Film Award. He sits on the board of directors for Contact, Toronto's International Photography Festival, and the Ryerson Image Centre. In 2006, he was awarded the title of Officer of the Order of Canada and currently holds seven honorary doctorate degrees. And I'd just like to say that um, he is a moving force in the very impressive uh, Toronto Photography Festival called Contact, and a principal force in the creation of Canada's most important award, the Scotiabank Award. Um, and that's how we actually met. You, in, 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 you invited me to be on the jury, and that led to me and you spending a yeah. few drunken nights together. Uh, <laughs> evenings. 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 Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Good call. Yeah. I caught that in time. <laughs> uh, and that led me to say, Ed, you've got great books with Gerhard Steidel, for the most part, and one overview called Manufactured Landscapes from the National Gallery of Canada, mid-career retrospective. But that's already it was already in the past. And I felt um, the need to sort of look at his aesthetic as a whole and for once, um, come away from the project focus on his work, oil, China, quarries, water, and see what united the work in each department. And I mention this now, we're not going to talk about essential elements, which was the, the book finally published uh, in detail here. But what struck me at the time was um, the spirit of collaboration. He's one of those photographers that can put his work on the table like this, and you can discuss it objectively. And you can say, and I don't think that image is particularly, you know, this one's better. And he'll say, mm, yeah, maybe you're right. Or, well, I kind of like it because it does this. Um, and there are another, there's another kind of photographer that puts their intestines on the table. And, they, and, and you go, I, I, they go no, don't touch. You know. And I really appreciated that. And, but I, secondly, I appreciated the fact that it's teamwork with you. And he have a, you have a fabulous studio, uh, great collaborators, and they're 
you're, you're, you're kind of one of a piece when you, when you work together. So it, it really was something that, it taught me something about um, your success, I think. And I think we're gonna talk a bit more about this as we go along. But I thought, it, to, just to begin now, um, I thought it'd be good to just make a quick map of where we are here, because you're here for a reason. Well, we've got a picture up here which is gonna give us an overview. There's a very big event happening in Canada in the fall uh, with European ramifications because it's gonna to come to Mast in Bologna and there's gonna be a new Steidel book. Um, but it's, all, it's also a question of the exhibition here. How many people have seen it already? Wow, Oh, that's impressive. And have you had the device, the interactive device? You've not quite as many. Okay, all right, okay. So could you just, let's take a look at this as a kind of guide for our discussion and um, see if you're happy with the, uh, if you can give us an overview of what this show is all about for you and then the big picture which is the Art Gallery of the National Gallery of Canada. Okay, well thank you Bill. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with you uh, and, and drinking at night. <laughs> um, what's different, the Anthropocene, again, a, a real quick question, Anthropocene, how many people have heard the word, not only because of this show, well, you've heard it before, uh, but Anthropocene is something that, um, that I've been working with my collaborators, uh, Jennifer Beishwalt and Nick Deponcier, and the difference between this project and all other projects, like if we go back to manufactured landscapes, I had already gone through most of China and I went to Bangladesh and, and then Jennifer saw the video that a videographer had done but couldn't quite pull together for a film and said, this is interesting, there's not enough there, let's, you know, let, I have to go to China with you. And, and, but the work was already pretty much done and she was extending the context uh, with uh, Peter Mettler at the time as a DOP and Nick was producing it. So then in, wa in Watermark, the water project, I was halfway through the project. Uh, and by the way, I also featured in that one as well in the film. And then the, and then the second one, we were halfway through the project. I was, and then Jennifer saw it, and then we decided to raise some money and try and do a water project, and then kind of collaborated on a lot of the, 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 the oh. subjects we went to after that. And I also appeared, and my images appeared in that film as well. And now Anthropocene, we started about five years ago and said, let's start from scratch together and start and looking at all the subjects that we want to do and agree on all those subjects. And, and that's different in my work. So I've often collaborated with you know, people helping me create, but all of a sudden here, we're all sitting around and you saw in my office on the wall, there was this kind of map and we had this right. map room of all the images and locations mm -hmm. and we would then decide collectively uh, which ones are we going to go after and which ones do we want to do AR, VR, which ones do we want to do filmically, which ones I'm going to do with stills and each had different combinations. So this was, that was different for me on, on that level of working together because now we're right in the whole creative process of where do we go, what the, what's the subject and how do we get at it. But you, could, you couldn't have done that without those other two filmic experiences, right? I mean, that, well, I think it's just leading to it yeah, now, yeah. Right. And now I'm completely out of the film and behind the camera with them uh -huh. and, and, and you know, kind of guiding what the subject is, what we want to do, what fits where and how we're going to tell this story. So, so to me that was, a, that, that's been a new way of working that I, in the past, it's, a lot, it's been me kind of more as a lone person, mm -hmm. but having mm -hmm. teams that I build around myself, but now we're collaborating in, the, in a more of a creative realm. So why don't you tell us, in your words, Anthropocene, what it means? Uh, well, Anthropocene, you know, in many ways it means that, you know, we as human beings are changing um, the world's systems more than any, all natural systems combined. So we are now having a global impact and leaving uh, a fingerprint of our, of our activity in the, the topsoil, in the soil, in the oceans of our, pa of our presence here. So we're having a global impact on so the planet. A new, a new geological age, is, is that correct? That's a correct. A new geological era. And it's important because all kinds of political decisions will flow from that. If it's, it hasn't been officially recognized, am I correct? 
No, it hasn't been ratified yet, no. So that enables conservative powers to kind of hold back on action. Yeah, I mean, there's still denial, although it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, how one, you know, could still be there with just, just turn on the news and, and there should be enough evidence or walk outside and feel the changing of the weather patterns and you should know that something's afoot. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, there still, is, uh, uh, there still is a fair amount of uh, denial in, in, in that this is happening. But, um, you know, I think that ratifying the Anthropocene, I do believe, will help the conversation move forward. In other words, scientifically we're now saying, that scientists are now saying this is, you know, we've tipped into another epoch. Mm -hmm. and, and those epochs usually, you know, come with a lot of, you know, activity, global activity, weather activity. If we look at one of the last big ones where the extinction event was quite massive, the 65 million years ago, where uh, a meteor hit the planet, um, that's the period in which that dark decade or, or two that persisted after that with the iridium cloud slowly coming back to Earth, leaving about a one inch layer of iridium around the planet and that becomes the marker. But that is the moment that 70% of life was extinguished including all the dinosaurs and large mammals. So, so these, these epo epochal transitions usually come with extinction events. So the big extinction event, which is known as the sixth great extinction, uh, which is happening right now, we are the equivalent of, of the meteor impact causing that extinction. And we may be extinguished as well. Well, we don't know what happens when we take all of that biodiversity out and, and diminish it and weaken all of those systems and, and take all that habitat and sort of like put human systems, whether it's you know, urban systems or industrial systems or farm, farming is by far the largest one, and we, when we do that on that scale, we don't really know what we're losing in the process. And, and, and I think it's the, 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 the diversity and the challenge and the complexity of that mm. is even beyond science today to really understand you know, you know, and to keep up with what the consequences of human activity is. There was an expression uh, I just pulled out from Murray Wright, who wrote about your book, uh, Murray Wright, yeah, in the Toronto Star. And he said, your work oozes uncomfortable truths. It oozes un so things that we would rather not admit to. But at the same time, your aesthetic is uh, so engaging and powerful that you invite us to look. And, and, then, and then the messages sink home, I find. Sometimes it's detail. I watch people in the show suddenly drawing attention. Just look, look at this. Look at, look at the scale of this. It, it takes a moment. but. The fact is your work appeals. And another expression, um, Kenneth, I've written my notes too quickly here. He said, aesthetic collide, Kenneth Baker. Sorry. Kenneth Baker, yeah. Uh, aesthetics collide with conscience. So you, you have, do you find this as, uh, does this come as a criticism? Do you, or do you find it, do you find yourself kind of defending the work looking too beautiful. Well, I mean, there, the, there is, there's always the danger, I believe, that, that by aestheticizing something, you know, that is, you know, horrible or horrific, uh, des can desensitize us to it, say, oh, it's okay, it's because it looks okay. But, and one, is, one can argue that on, you know, aestheticizing Wharf Darby. I, I know that Alex Webb was once challenged for that because he was really doing beautiful uh, formal pictures of, right. Of, of you know war and, and all this devastation with death in, in, in the image as well, and, but at the same time we would never uh, you know if we look back and and, and even look at um, you know Shakespeare and Richard III if you think in in prose and in, in, in poetry you can speak about something that that is challenging and horrific and and uh, you know and and, and violent and yet you know, put a layer of aesthetic, a layer of, 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 of words, so it's okay with words. Filmically, you know, you, I often say, you look at something like Apocalypse Now, and it's, it's a horrific you know, situation that's occurred at war, but it's mm -hmm. beautifully filmed by Francis yeah. Ford Coppola. No one, no one criticizes that each frame is a luscious frame as it goes yeah. by. Still seem to have more of an ethical, people feel it has more of an ethical responsibility in terms of aesthetics. 
and it's and it's been ch and, st and actually visual arts in a way has has also in general has kind of turned in, in postmodernism aesthetics this kind of leveling that aesthetics is a hierarchy but trying to keep everything you know away from a hierarchical in that whether it's a concern that the beautiful objects are you know are are are, are kind of delivering something to the market or, or the challenge of those kinds of questions that come forward. My intention is more to engage, that if you don't have the viewer engaged in the image, that you, you then the, the, where's, the communi where's the communication? Yeah. Where, how do I you know, permeate yeah. through consciousness to that person? And once they're engaged, there is a chance for a raising of consciousness, I believe. That then now I'm concerned, what is that thing? Why am I looking at it? And I don't see them as answers, or, but maybe more as questions and inflection points for a deeper understanding of these places, because I still maintain that these are real places in the world, although they look abstract and they look you know, like how can this be, or what can, the, you know, where did this come from, or is this really what part of our planet, is this something we've done, and, and, and yes, indeed it is. It's from a very, pers you know, uh, kind of control perspective, it, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, using my knowledge of art history, I'm using my knowledge of technology to bring these things together, but, you know, for me it's not, the challenge, I can make a, a, a pretty banal picture, you know, Easily and quite well. It's not a, but the thing is, if you look at the same subject matter in ugly light and, and, and the crudeness of day, and you know, and not maybe well composed, uh, who'd be looking? Like there'd be no discussion yeah. over this. So well, there's no danger there. I've gone through all his all his archives, uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of prints, probably. I never found one like that. So <laughs> not to worry about. No, it. okay. Uh, and because uh, he has a marvelous uh, visual presentation for us, um, so I think we should probably just jump through a whole bunch jump, of stuff. Get into that, and um, then we'll come back to some questions about how it all started. Okay. I might just do it from here. We were talking about doing from yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. Wherever you're more comfortable. So again, this is uh, uh, Jennifer and Nick, my collaborators. We're currently, at the, in this particular shot, we're, we're flying a drone and, and we're doing some stuff in, in uh, uh, Germany on the largest open pit uh, copper mine, a uh, coal mine in the world. Um, so again, a quick, you know, definition of Anthropocene and, and we are kind of at the, at the kind of uh, cusp of doing permanent planetary change. This gives us kind of like the whole extinction rates uh, and the different mass extinctions. And now we're at, you know, in the last, you know, um, 100 years and really in the last 60 years since the Second World War, it's known as a great acceleration. So, you know, from 2 billion just after the Second World War, we're now at 8 billion. So it's almost uh, a billion people per decade of my life, you know. So something mm -hmm. is dramatically changing. And that was one of the ideas when I began over 30 years ago was that, is that if I was looking at projections of human population and looking at resources coming from Canada and I said, these two things together, where there's, we live in a finite planet. So I always thought capitalism has one fail point is that you know, p infinite growth would mean infinite resources. But there's a certain plateau that you know, the resources will become scarce mm -hmm. and growth will be under, you know, undermined. So, you know, whether technology can find through nanotechnology the replacements for the resources that we are normally having to go to nature for, that remains to be seen, but, and that may happen, but, the, but in terms of the traditional way of doing it, we're gonna run out of copper, we're gonna run out of easily achievable steel, uh, metal and iron and all that. So I was thinking that as I would start doing this work, the scale would continue to evolve as I'm doing the work because it would follow the population curve. So, so it was one of these things that I thought was an interesting life project to begin to engage in 1982 with this thinking of it as a life project. Um, this, each one of those layers uh, um, is um, about 10,000 years. So if you, uh, so I kind of, when I saw that and I saw these two people sunbathing, I kind of, the, like the whole of civilization occurred in one of those bands, you know, it was from when we started civilization in one of those layers. Uh, and, and it kind of makes you think in terms of, you know, are we just this soft, fleshy, transient species, you know, in this deep geological time when put up against time like this. 
Um, so these are some of the categories, technofossils, plastics, for instance, anything concrete. All the, concrete is the number one technofossil, so you know, this building has tons of concrete. I, I, in the future, uh, if a geologist was digging through, he'd, he'd come across concrete, the composition of concrete, and he'd say, oh, nature doesn't produce concrete. So therefore, this is a part of the Anthropocene. So that, in the, mm -hmm. the strata, concrete appearing would be considered a marker of the Anthropocene. Plastics is the same thing. All our wastes and all the way in oceans were plastic layers down. If in the future you're digging through and you saw layers and there was plastic in that, in that, in that layer of rock, aha, I'm at the Anthropocene. So it's a marker of our time, and that's how geologists and scientists are looking at that. So we're using their kind of categories and trying to find the visual equivalents to the kinds of uh, research they're doing that speak to the Anthropocene. This old telephones, plastics, our cell phones, our computers, if not recycled, they become uh, part of it. Aluminum, another aspect. Uh, the na in nature, aluminum does not occur. It's a process through using bauxite. So again, it, you'd never find that naturally in nature. But this aluminum, if left and covered over time, discovered five million years from now, you'd say, aha. We're in the Anthropocene. Tires, oil byproducts, and these are computer boards in China. So I'm also mixing this up with some earlier work. And in many ways, most of my work somehow fits because I've been photographing human systems on the planet. It's almost the whole body of my work can on some level fit into the definition of the Anthropocene. Extraction, this is one of the largest machines. This is the largest machine, the one in the distance called a bagger. It's uh, 100 meters high, uh, 300 meters uh, in length. Uh, it has 18 buckets that, that scoop. So there'll be some uh, images, uh, video images of the bucket that work uh, later on in this presentation. Um, open pit mines. This is a copper mine in the um, United States, uh, in Arizona. Again, scale. And one of the things that I've always been interested in is the largest examples of the scale at which we as humans are engaging with resource extraction. So I often research the biggest places. And much of this, of course, is, is perpetuated by, the, the, by technology and the discovery of the internal combustion engine and cheap fuel to power that engine. So the piece downstairs that I did, the, the um, AR piece, is a, is, is a kind of reflection and meditation on the internal combustion engine the, from beginning to end of life. Um, again, another open pit mine in, in America. And tailings. You can't have these kinds of mines, this scale of mine, without tailings, both dry and wet tailings. They are a consequence of mining because as you create a void, you have to put all that material somewhere. And it's usually in the valleys beside the mine that doesn't economically makes sense to go much beyond where the mine is actually uh, occurring. So each mine, as a consequence of mining, has a tailings piles. And this is wet tailings. So the last one was dry tailings. This is wet. Dry tailings and wet tailings are both equally dangerous in the landscape. Dry tailings are still highly mineralized rock that, that, that is used but is not enough mineral to put into the process. But it still has sulfur and different kind you know, uh, different toxic um, materials inside it, uh, arsenic at times, if it's gold. And so that continues in that broken tailings, uh, the dry tailings. When it rains, it still leaches off that and goes into the water table. So those are usually active for two to 300 years after they're, they've been piled up. And wet tailings are usually contained. They're, they're very you know, um, regulated, because if, they, these, if these uh, levees break and, and that pours out into the landscape, it is absolutely toxic. And but they do. And they they do. do. They do, yes. Can I just point out the scale here, and just in case someone hasn't seen the picture down? You can see the scale of the vast factory here. See that? How long is that? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's it, huge. It, yeah. Hundreds of meters long. Yeah, yeah. So it, when you get up in the top of the picture, there are, and I'm always trying to net, not get too far away from the image that those small details become insignificant. So I'm usually trying to fly or be anywhere from you know, seven, 800 feet to several thousand feet. Once you get past 2,000 feet, the details become too small and insignificant. So I'm usually within 
that range of shooting in the air. Will we talk later about plane, helicopter, drone? We'll come back. Sure. To yeah. And I have, yes. Yeah, There's different absolutely. strategies in each, for yeah. each, yeah. Uh, this is recent, this is more of a, a, a positive Anthropocene landscape in that what they're going after here is lithium. So we're trying to also in the film and in the book, uh, we're all trying to think of stories and, and locations that uh, are positive. And so lithium is a key component to batteries and batteries are a key component to the electric car. And the electric car is a way that we can get away from the internal combustion engine and start to have quieter, cleaner cities and not load um, that CO2 into the atmosphere as we are currently doing. This is also from, from the lithium mines. Uh, also, um, fertilizer comes out of this process as well. So it's uh, uh, potassium, potassium nitrate, and potassium sulfite are, are two byproducts or products. It used to be the main product, and now lithium is the most valuable product, but they're still making uh, a million tons of each of potassium nitrate and sulfite uh, as well for fertilizer. Uh, quarries from extraction, extracting stone to build buildings, countertops. And then this is also uh, from a Russia pot, um, potash mine that we were in together, both filming and shooting stills and doing uh, virtual reality. We were capturing the whole tunnels in virtual reality. These are some of the tunnels of the underground mines in Russia. Uh, so you're seeing a few images from the next Anthropocene uh, show. And that's the tunnels that you go through. So the red is the product. And this is an ancient seabed, but, there's, um, but they're getting, uh, it's a potash mine, and, and the fertilizers are coming you know, from, that, from the red. So that's the, that's the product that they're after. Energy, of course. Um, this is a, a, a steel plant, bow steel, in, in um, China. Uh, oil refinery. And uh, this is an Irving oil refinery in eastern Canada. And then uh, oil in, in the Niger Delta being uh, processed into diesel fuel illegally. This is an illegal uh, oil bunkering. And, the, and some of these images are on view downstairs as well as, as 60 by 80 prints. And it is one of the most contested and, and kind of desecrated landscapes I've ever witnessed where um, it, this, the kind of oil that's being spilled into this landscape makes the BP oil spill look like nothing. That was 60,000 barrels a day. The estimates are anywhere from 200 to 250,000 um, uh, barrels a day are being dumped into the landscape. So, and that, that it's being dumped because they can't, they can get, they can, through, through this illegal system of bunkering, they can get some gasoline, 2% gasoline, 2% kerosene, and then 40% of diesel, leaving them with about 55% of goopy black oil that would normally be used for asphalt, plastics, and all the other things we use oil for, 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 for creating fabrics or whatever we do with it. And they, they can't do anything with it because they don't have that technology. So they, jump, they dump that 55% that into the land. So it is an oil-soaked landscape. Agriculture, it's also known as you know, among scientists is terraforming. So we're taking desert and adding water from, an, from irrigation and we get fertile farmland. But in this image, it kind of shows what was and uh, what, what, what nature intended, the, the landscape that was intended there, and then the landscape that we could create once we redivert water from, this is from the Colorado River, and turn it into to the most productive alfalfa farms in all of America. Uh, this is what was, um, uh, Primary jungle, tropical rainforest. So this was a tropical rainforest maybe you know, uh, three years ago and has now been converted to a palm plantation. Deforestation, so that's a combination of you know, like going to farming or just using it for wood or clearing for many other things for lumber. This is in Makoko and Lagos. This is again a, 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 a jungle being converted into, into a palm plantation. And now on the left, you have a very kind of last, last legs of the tropical rainforest, and, and they're still clearing it with logs. So in the big print, you can see all the logs fallen, but they're still, it's still been, still been 
deteriorating, and now on the right, it's a complete conversion where they're about ready to turn it into a palm plantation, which is a very dangerous um, process that's occurring right now because of the scale of it is so vast. Urbanization is another footprint. This is, I went, I've often gone after the largest, you know, fastest growing cities in the world. So at that time in 2004, when I was shooting this, um, Shanghai was growing, it had grown a million citizens per year for five years in a row. And so the city was growing at a, at a pace. Um, currently, Lagos is the fastest growing city in the world. This was in China in the project that I did. Uh, back when, and um, this was a, a, a shift change, and, and, and factory workers who were making shoes were, were um, heading off for dinner. Uh, they, would, they would pulse them about 15,000 at a time. Every 20 minutes, they could put 15,000 people through five floors of one of these buildings, and the next 15,000 would come through. In an hour, they would feed 40,000 people, uh, workers. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> it's staggering, staggering, staggering yeah. the numbers. Yeah. Uh, Makoko, this is a, a kind of a organically forming, um, I would guess it would be low, low rental living. The, 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 you can actually get a set of stilts, build a, literally a, a, a small house on top of those stilts. There's no plumbing, there's no electricity, there's uh, no toilets. Uh, and at dinner time, this is around dinner time, everybody fires up coal and they make their dinner, and the boats are selling water and food up these. And there's about 200,000 people who live in Makoka. This is a, this is a organically growing uh, city uh, off, off of Lagos. And Lagos is currently one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And then the ex extinction events. Uh, the whole team went to, uh, and we covered this in many, many ways, filmically, stills-wise, uh, 3D-wise, and Again, I'm shooting after the fire with my with stills, um, you know. And then in the extinction events, we also looked at the carving, the industry of carving. This was woolly mammoth tusks. We were never able to get into a, a an elef elephant tusk carving studio because, of, of course, it was illegal. But woolly mammoth studios, we could. But again, it's a high level of craft. These these uh, these carvings would take up to a decade, and he was selling them for millions of dollars per per carving. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit lens-based lens technology. So this is film cameras. That's, that's Nick shooting, shooting the, 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 the tusk burn. Uh, I've got, so while he's doing that, I've got another camera on a drone, and I'm doing a video capture right now of the burning flying the drone across. Uh, that's a stills camera on a drone. I, I, I did a big panoramic picture of, of Lagos, so I'm sending, sending my camera up and doing multiple frames and stitching them together. Um, and then Photography 3.0 is what you're actually experiencing downstairs. We did a quick little video for anybody who hasn't been down. So you can actually, uh, this is showing the iPad. So, so in the 3D, you can actually get the image and the person you know, in the image together. And this is a, a, a quick little video that, that uh, somebody put together for me yesterday. If I can show just, it. Just before you turn oh. it, okay. I don't know if I can no, stop okay. it. No, it's okay. It's okay. Or if I stop it, it'll look through. No. So this, this is showing the kind of experience you can have with it. So the target itself triggers the experience, and then you can walk in the full round. So it allows, I think, the, the viewer of the image to experience it in, 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 the, in the round, so it's, it's act, you actively participate with, um, you know, with, the, with the object versus the more passive looking at a print. Uh, so it is more like sculpture uh, to me. It's, it, it's like thinking in, in terms of photography and sculpture together. So, um, And then in, in the murals, we're also doing something where we're allowing the AR trigger, so we're allowing the mural to trigger uh, an extended video response. So all of a sudden, you can start seeing how a, a, a block is being harvested, or you can see uh, a pull away of the whole quarry. So we're also, uh, and, and Nick and Jen are working on the video extensions of the still image. So it again, engaging the viewer in, in, in multiple ways and more interactive ways with 
this, with, with the images. And this is giving you an idea of photo, photography 3.0. So, so I, I think 1.0 is the whole chemical history of photography. 2.0 is when we moved it to a chip and now photography is ones and zeros. And 3.0 is taking that same you know, sensor and doing multiple pictures and not only doing, being able to do a huge mural with it as the next di dimension of photography, which could never happen with conventional film, or we can now piece them together. So this tusk pile, before it burned, that was burning the next day, so we all got together and shot uh, about 2,500 images using, those are two um, Sony A7 cameras, 40 megapixel cameras, and about, about three to four feet away from the subject, and then also having someone else going in and shooting all the nooks and crannies in, 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 in all the holes to get that information. The software then goes and puts all of that together. So I'm trying to recreate, and, and the team is trying to recreate that in a museum setting where you can now experience it in the round and walk around it. So we end up with 2,500 images similar to this. They're put together, and what happens is that the software then turns it into a three-dimensional image. So you're looking at all the polygons. So this is what, what the actual f texture will map onto to make it three-dimensional. And then this is the actual texture map. So this is all the photographic texture and all the, the color and tone. So in Photoshop, I would then use this texture map to color correct, contrast control, and do all the things, density and all the things I would do in photography. And then this gets mapped onto the polygons. And now this is uh, a, a 3D replica, a digital replica of the tusk pile that you can walk around at scale within um, a museum setting. So you'd have to have a very big room to be able to walk around this and experience the tusk pile in the third dimension. But it is literally a, a three-dimensional photograph of, of, of the tusk pile. And it burned the next day, so there's no way one can experience this again. So this leaves it as a photograph into the future. Um, this is, allows, again, a, an, an experience that, uh, that could be shared in a museum setting. This is just a hypothetical situation that we've put together. Uh, also, it can be printed. Once you have that file, I have a 3D color printer, and that's only about 10 inches high, but you can print the whole thing as a 3D object as well. And what I'm going to show after this is there's a five-minute clip uh, of, the, of excerpts from the film. Some of it will be in the film, some of it won't. It was something we did um, about a, a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, early on in the, in, in the process. But um, it's just five minutes uh, uh, of give, giving you an idea of some of the subject in the film. If we can turn the sound up a bit on this, too. Plastic, not plastic. The Anthropocene is the time in the geological record when humans have moved the planet outside its natural limits. How acceleration starts with industrial revolution. It starts with this that we could make the machines. It could be a bleep but it could be a full-scale catastrophic change.
if you go out into any landscape, any landscape, except for North Siberia or North Canada, it is an anthropogenic landscape. We have not a way to get back. We live now in a different world. Okay. <laughs> Where did it all start? Where did it all start? <laughs> I think it, with uh, agriculture in the Nile Delta, <laughs> where we just started to live together in closed spaces and had to invent all the rules and cities. And so, you know, that from hunter-gatherer to where we are today, it was, it was farming that actually was the, was the thing that held us and made it, forced us to live together. So. Um, and that's where I think all the rules and law and marriage and religion and all those things are, are, are things that were brought to bear so that we can coexist and, and, and not rip each other apart. So yeah, I, I, I was thinking of Harari as you were saying that, who talks about maybe a wrong turn that we made where we went from hunting gathering, which, which is a lot healthier for the human body, to <laughs> agriculture. Yeah. Things started to go wrong at that point. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Well, it, was the, uh, uh, it made for some great opportunities and some really interesting... I mean, we're here today as a result of technology yeah. and a result of... And makes for some great photographs, too. No. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't have a camera back then as a hunter-gatherer. We need to work together to make things like that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you said something which has always impressed me. You said uh, you began photographing the towers of Toronto, and um, it occurred to you that these gleaming monoliths must have left corresponding holes in the ground. Um, so that was a kind of definitive moment for you, a definitive revelation in a sense. But you also talk about your trip to Frackville, yeah. aptly named Frackville, which, which also planted a seed that something had to be done. So I think maybe we could talk a bit about how you started on this quest. Well, it was, it was interesting because I, 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 um, I was born and raised in St. Catharines, which was across, like literally across Lake Ontario on the other side. So on a clear day, I could stand on a pier and look across and see the towers. But it wasn't until I was 17, so I could see them, you know, looming in that distant landscape, but I never stood amongst them. I remember the first time, I think it was like 16, and standing there and looking at the I.M. Pei Tower and... and uh, yeah, other great architects and, and their like 60, 60 story towers and thinking, like just looking at their scale, all of a sudden when you, when you are there and you haven't been, you've never experienced a, 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 you know, a tower like that in, 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 in the presence of it, at the foot of it, I was, I remember taking and, and it, I began to think that, wow, there must be places as vast where we take material, that there's a yin to the yang. I was always interested in kind of nature and, and, and that kind of unspoiled landscape and uh, recognizing that there is uh, this consequence. So the, I've always, as a re and as a resource country, you know, w much of the economy was being driven by the trees and, and the minerals and, uh, you know, largely those things. Of, of course, there was fish in the East Coast and other things, but we were by and large a resource economy. Um, and of course, oil now in Alberta was another resource that, that was driving us. So, so it, uh, it, I kept thinking that, that as an artist, it's, it, you know, photograph what you know. And, I'd, and my father had worked in factories as well, so I got to see engine plants and early, at seven mm -hmm. and, and the making of engines. And I got to see, you know, um, these guys, you know, flipping ingots and creating parts for the steering wheel and then steering knuckle. And, uh, and so that pounding of a forge that I used to hear as a kid, all of a sudden you see the men with these red hot ingots flipping them and, and, and putting 
an image to the sound, uh, you know, at a very young age. And so large industry and our impact. And, and, and it, like, the other thing that was interesting in St. Catharines is I used to, it's now been flattened, but the, the factory was called McKinnon's. My father worked there. And we would drive by, it was on, on Ontario Street, and we would drive by that, and it was just literally a bare concrete wall. But when I, at seven, when I went to the open house and saw where my dad were, it was this whole other world. And it was like, you know, the you know, pour, metal, you know, pouring down shoots into mm -hmm. engine blocks and, you know, men in silver suits and ingots. And so I realized that that world that is behind the walls that make, are things that we take for granted every day. Because I was in the car that, it was a GM car that was being made by that factory. So you kind of start to realize that there's all these other worlds out there that are, that we don't have no idea uh, of what they are, but we partake of mm -hmm. what comes out of those places every day. So that I think were the very early seeds uh, of, you know, taking this on as a, as a kind of a life project. And can you talk about how the first project, defined as a project, took form for you? The first one where you said there's something greater than a photograph, or two or three photographs. Um, it, would, it would have been going to, to Toronto when I finally moved, and I went to Ryerson. And a fantastic first year teacher, uh, his name was Rob Gublar, and um, so we hit it off right away. I, I really, uh, you know, we, we, I could really understand what, where he was trying to take me and the kinds of ideas he was trying to instill. And one of his first assignments was to go and photograph evidence of man. And, uh, and it was, okay. And, and I thought, okay, evidence of man. Well, that would be things that we've, to me, my early thoughts of it, well, that would be things where we built something and then left it and abandoned it. And, uh, and now it's being grown over. So I thought of rune as evidence, you know, that, 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 that will, a passing. So my first, and I didn't, we don't have runes in, 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 mm -hmm. in, in, in Canada because we're, we're a freshly minted country, so to speak. <laughs> um, and so, but the, I did remember that in St. Catharines, there was a whole bunch of runes left over from the four previous paths of the Welland Canal. So I then I researched the Welland Canal, and this is like 19, I guess, 76, 77. So I researched the Welland Canal and started doing four by five images of the last bits of the, right. what I could find. So there'd be like earth, and then there'd be like an abutment that was still tilted that used to be a wall of the canal. So I started looking at those as a very, very early iteration of, uh, of how, to again, to photograph evidence of our passing, and then and I still think in some ways I'm doing the exact same assignment that I got in that first year, you know. Uh, it's just expanding on it a bit. Um, but it is this kind of, but what it, what it did, what was interesting about it as an assignment was that it gave me like a, a pass card to say, okay, I know I'm a human, but I'm going to act like an alien looking at what these humans are doing. So it kind of gave me that, so I know I'm implicated in all of this, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying, but it gave me that once removed, more objective kind of license to begin to say, I am after the evidence of what this species is up to. Huh. I know I'm part, but so that kind of, you know, alien ticket was really interesting to say, to uh, see. You know, I, I, I hear respect in your voice for that factory and what was going on there, and your father worked in it. Do you think that, that working class background um, did give you that respect? Because if you'd been a, a privileged kid that uh, was parachuted into that and would always not have experienced it, maybe you wouldn't have had the feel that you have for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I worked in those factories, and you it's hard worked. work. Yeah, yeah, I worked two years in, in assembly lines, uh, production plant. So assembly is when you're putting parts together. Production is when you're stamping out the things and. And, yeah, and moving yeah. them on a line. So I've done both of those. I spent a full two years to put myself through school. My father died when I was 15. And so in the six years of post-secondary school, I had to work every summer to make tuition and, and to make that year and get loans. My mother you know, had no resource. Mm -hmm. so, so literally, it was, it was up to me to either I had an education or not, but it was up to me to figure that out. So, so I think that coming out of those kind of challenges and, and and looking and having uh, empathy for the worker, I really mm -hmm. do understand how hard it is to, to earn a living. And so when I go see those same 
people doing assembly work you know, in China, it's, it's no easier for them. It's just a dreary, killer job. And then that work is now going to Africa and Bangladesh. So it is, I'm, I'm following the industrial revolution that's now moved from the West to China. And now China's offshoring their manufacturing and they plan to offshore 75 million jobs in manufacturing to Africa uh, uh, and uh, it, you know, all other Asian countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh mm -hmm. are now all being set up by Chinese mm -hmm. factory owners and being trained by Chinese in these, in these countries. Uh, new empire. Uh, next empire. The new boss, I call it. So uh, the first project that came to fruition was? In I think the first one where yeah. all of a sudden um, people started noticing what I was doing yeah. was the um, 19, 1982, I started photographing mine. So the Frackville thing that you spoke about was coming across this mined landscape, and I'd worked in mines, and I'd seen yeah. open pit mines when I was putting myself through school. So one of my summer jobs was up in Red Lake, you know, um, at the farthest northern city town in, in, in Ontario, and it was a gold mine. It was actually ca uh, Canada's richest gold mine. And I was working underground in the gold mine, but I got to see some open pit mines. So mining was something that I was aware of, but never thought of as a subject. And then I was going through uh, Pennsylvania, made a wrong turn, and trying to cut back, I went through this mining area that I had no idea was there, and Frackville was this town. So I, out in the outskirts of Frackville, I got out of my car and looked around, and all of a sudden recognized, it was a very surreal landscape, and I recognized that nothing in that landscape, in a full 360 from that hill, was undisturbed. It was all man-made, and it was d this distant view as far as I could see. So I started taking pictures of that landscape, and I was doing other landscape pictures, more pristine landscapes, kind of, kind of following a bit in an Elliot Porterish kind of way, uh, color, compressed landscapes, really high density of, of you know, uh, you know, twigs and leaves that created a kind of a more of a, a surface. I wasn't interested in traditional landscape. I was interested in kind of uh, abstract expressionist painting. But I got, I saw that, and then when I was printing them. I came across the, these, I kept coming into the mining pictures as four by fives, and it was like halfway through printing, I stopped printing those and started printing those and said, aha, this feels more authentic to my time. This, the, the e earlier ones were like, you know, almost like this nostalgia wanting to kind of go back to that, you know, that, that untouched, uh -huh. untrammeled land, but this, this, this transformed landscape somehow speaks more truly and resonates more, and I felt, that, and that's where I had that kind of tipping moment where I started looking and researching mines. So then I did mines and then I decided, uh, and then on another trip and uh, I saw some, uh, on a rafting trip I saw some rail cuts when I was going down the, the Thompson River and I, and I said, oh that, that's amazing to, to, to try and get those rails and through really treacherous countryside, these, these rails. So the rail cut series I think in the first mines that I did in 1982, 83, mm -hmm. I think is where my work really began. That's what, that's when, and then mm -hmm. museums immediately responded to the rail cut mm -hmm. series and the mining series. They started purchasing them. And at that time it was the National Film Board Stills Division. They started purchasing my work at that. So all of a sudden all the museums, there was no market at that time, but the, the, but the, but the museums and the institutions mm -hmm. that collected photography were all of a sudden responding to that work. So that was the very beginning. It's interesting to see if you, if I studied your biography, um, it, it really kind of ripples out from, from Toronto and Eastern Canada to Montreal. It ripples across the country almost. And then uh, I think a big, a big leap was manufactured landscapes, I think. Isn't that correct? Is a, yeah. Something that brought in international recognition. There's a, there's a couple things. Yeah, the, the you you things. had some American shows in galleries, for example. Yeah. And I had an American deal. Uh, so I had a dealer. Uh, in New York uh, in 1987. Uh, so it already, so my, I started kind of selling to institutions with my prints uh, in 82, 83 and getting grants. So it would be like mm -hmm. the British Arts Council grant here or the NEA in America. We had the Canada Council grant. So I was getting grants and selling a few prints and kind of getting by that way, doing a little right. bit of freelance work with four by five architecture work right. to get through that time. But uh, I think 
it was, in, I think 93 was a pivotal moment where uh, I, I imagined uh, that there were these incredible landscapes, uh, you know, quarries. I, I'd, I'd never seen a dimensional stone quarry, but I imagined after doing all these mines that there had to be these landscapes, having never seen it, where they remove a block of stone at a time. And I thought the residual landscape would have more of an architectonic uh -huh. appearance. So I did, so I started researching, I went to libraries, I went to quarry, you know, big quarry convention and talked to the quarry, I mean, where are the big quarries? And they said, go to Barry, Vermont. So then I started going further afield and I started shooting quarries. And that was the first time I had not ever seen that, but I knew that landscape had to exist. And then I started to think my way into pictures. And then once I did that, then I was, at the, uh, I was in Vermont, and they said, and, and, and Vermont had a lot of the Italians from Carrera were running Vermont, that quarry that I was at. And they said, if you like this one, you're going to love Carrera. You know, uh, so I go, OK, great, i got to go to Carrera. And that's the first time I then went where I didn't speak the language. I had to move all my equipment to another country. I had to find somebody who could take me around. So that was my first shoot abroad. And to me, that was all of a sudden, it's like North America's not my palette anymore. It's the world. And after that, I just started doing international work everywhere. And, then, and to me, the idea was, where is the place in the world? And it doesn't matter where it is. So I've been in Russia with a team, with our teams. I've, we've been to all over the place. I, I think in this last shoot, we, we've been to 20 countries. So it's wherever the subject is. And now it's also wherever the camera needs to be. So the, can, the camera, I'm allowing the camera to want to be wherever it wants for the, sh for the picture. Where, and for the film camera, we're, we're also putting it up wherever it wants to be to get the, the best shot. So we're thinking our way into pictures all the time now. So it's a whole different way of working. Mm. Uh, I remember you talking about um, uh, using, uh, using Google to find interesting, uh, Google Maps to find interesting terrain. And then getting your helicopter, or your plane, going to the site. And then having calculated where the picture should be, how many feet, you'd kind of test it out. And then you would start to work. Just talk a bit about that process and then how maybe that segue into the drone thing, which has become such a, such a key part of your work now. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of setting the right distance for the picture, the one place where um, it really occurred to me that how, my relationship and the relationship of the camera to the landscape really mean. I used to have this rule, I'm not gonna go past 800, 1,000 feet for every reason I just said I want, and that was because I wanted this, all the, the bits and pieces, the little human, human artifacts, scale. human scale, like uh -huh. you can still see it in the print. So right. after I, but, so I went through and it was in, in, in Spain, I, I did this whole series on dry land farming and it was Manegros and I spent the whole day shooting at 800 feet and I um, came back from the day's shoot and looking at, and you can, of course, with digital, you can then review your shoot. And everything just felt like the compositions were just not working. Nothing's working. And I'm scratching my head going, why, you know, it's, it seemed like it would be far more interesting, but this is not working. And then, and then I went to Google Earth, and I went to the same region, and then I went to 800 feet and went around and started looking at it and going, oh, okay, I can see what's going on. I started pulling back, and then at about, 1,800 feet, uh -huh. all of a sudden the composition started looking really interesting. So I said, okay, to the pilot, we're going to do the exact same flight, but we're going to do it at 1,800 feet. Uh -huh. And then the whole... It all clicked. It all happened, and right. the images were fascinating the next day. And it was interesting, so I was sitting with the pilot at the second day, and I'm, I'm editing the ones, and I'd edited all my... Like you kind of, in, in Hasselblad, you just you put a green dot, and then I'm just looking at my, all, all my green dots, and I'm looking at them, and the pilot, the pilot goes by, the hell, and, he, and he's looking at it, and he's going, where's that? And I said, well, we just did this. this is, and he goes, what are you talking about? Where's that? And I said, well, this is what I'm shooting. And he, had, he said, I've flown over this place 50 times. I had no idea that was there. You know, he said, I had no idea that that, that. So it's interesting that, that even somebody who is totally familiar with the landscape is when you, and it, 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 it taught me something, it says that yeah. when you extract, uh, you know, that piece of something out of something, it totally transforms it. So mm -hmm. that when you see it in context, 
it doesn't have the doesn't same register. Pub, registry. Right. So I often say to people, they say, oh, I'd love to go. And I say, no, it's usually more interesting as a photograph than actually uh -huh. being there. You know, <laughs> it's true, though. Right. You know? So um, do we have time for questions? We have, I'm lost. We do. Can we open the floor up to, well, hands immediately up there. I'm not sure I'll be democratic here. We'll do both of you. This gentleman to start with and then pass the mic along when you're finished your question. Jing Talk, um, the fact that this Anthropocene project is going to link sort of the politics, if you like, to, uh, to the aesthetics, I think it's very exciting. I look forward to that. But my question is, you've talked us through your 3D process. Can you talk us through your, your 2D process, if you like? Take, for example, that picture of wet tailings. How do you go from capturing your images on drones to getting that amazing final product? Uh, the, 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 one, the bigger tailings pictures were actually done, and it's whatever I can get. Like, there was no helicopters, for instance, in those tailings pictures, the one that kind of looks like the medieval tapestry. Uh, and so I had to find a uh, Cessna. So you can actually shoot from a Cessna uh, if you open the window and you kind of push the, the, the passenger seat back as far as possible, crank your back around you know, as far as you can and shoot past the strut backwards, you can actually get a view. And, and that's, it's one I've shot a lot of pictures of. So you have to really work with pilots to, to kind of turn, to see the subject you want and just start turning proper circles so you can shoot out the back and get the subject from that perspective. So, that, so it, it's, it's a lot of the uh, time it took to figure out how to do pictures from the air is a lot of trial and error and learning how to speak to a pilot to get them in a position at the right speed, in the right place, at the right time where you can get the shutter speeds up. Because at the end of the day, I wanted all my aerial pictures to look like I had put the tripod, like a four by five on a, you know, the camera on a tripod and squeezed off a shot and nothing moved. But I'm in this crazy moving, you know, shaking plane uh, with wind blowing and, and trying to have that still kind of contemplative moment of a still perfectly composed and shot from a tripod like a four by five. So that took a while. I mean, I, I wasted a lot of chopper and airplane time trying to get that right. Um, but eventually got to the point where, you know, I was able to communicate with pilots and get what I wanted. You never shook, I, I never shoot through the plexi windows or never shoot through glass because it's kind of why, you know, you're, you've paid a lot of money for a hassle bag, you know, an expensive piece of glass, and you put it through plexi of a helicopter, and you've just taken it to about a, you know, $20 lens. Um, so, so it just doesn't, so you have to, you know, plan air. You gotta just have open air between you and the subject. So it's taken a lot of trial and error, um, and, and actually, quite frankly, when, when, I, when I worked with drones, there's a gentleman, Mike Reed, who, who's come along with us, and he's part of our team, a collaborative team. And he's learned to, and he's actually set up a small company uh, doing drones for other, other um, artists and films, et cetera, et cetera. But the drone, once you get that right, you can actually say, go up there, go a little bit to the left, go a little, and so I'm looking at, so I have a GoPro looking at the ground glass of the Hasselblad, sending a, a video signal to, me on the ground, and I'm controlling the head, so it's like a full XYZ head, uh, so I can do all the movements I want, and then when I push the shutter, it, the, it flashes, so I know it's working in, you know, in, the, in the air, so I know I'm actually, my, my shutter's working, and it's actually a better way to work, because I can say, okay, lock it there, hold it there, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I say, okay, move over a bit, you know, go, go, go away from us, another you know, you know, 50 feet or something, and he would pretty much be able to estimate that, come down a bit. So we're just talking side by side, and I'm actually controlling it far more precisely than a helicopter or a plane. A helicopter or a plane, if I don't think I got it, I'd say, okay, 
can you do a quick loop and try and do the exact same thing again? And it's never the exact same thing again. You're always off a bit. And it's really amazing that you can be off 100 or 200 feet when you're in the air, and you think, OK, I'm that far up in the air. It should still be OK. It's a landscape down there. It never is the same. Oftentimes, you just can't get it again. So you're, that, that point of view is always moving. So it is uh, um, a challenge often to, to kind of get, get the image. It's interesting because you also say you've used the word essential element to talk about that on the ground. You've said uh, you know, the picture has to be taken just here, not, not there. Not there, just here. So it's the same thing with the drone, in fact. Yep. It's that, it's that precise. Can I, there was this lady here who was first with the hand up. Um, well, industrial um, husbandry is something that I have shot over time. Um, and it, it's very, very difficult to get at that. Um, you know, there's um, you know, most companies that are working at, at scale uh, don't want film cameras or cameras anywhere near it. Um, and, and they just see no benefit. They, they, there's no upside to their business to let uh, a, a camera show. And, and that's which speaks to what they understand too is that uh, you know to, to feed the scale of humanity that's here today, the you know the the, the systems of, of how we bring protein to market is brutal and inhuman, and there's no probably easier way to make it less brutal and less inhuman. You could probably improve it a bit, but it still is a large scale process. You know where animals are you know, no different than grain or corn or whatever. It's just, a, a, again, a conveyor of, 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 of protein that has to come off these, these um, industries. So, and I mean, the only, the, the one Anthropocene, I was actually uh, having a conversation today um, with Jan and Colin, who are from the Anthropocene Working Group, and we had lunch today. But one of the th uh, one of the markers of the Anthropocene they were saying is there's a big paper on it is chickens. So ch because the chicken is no has no resemblance, there's nothing 100 years ago in in nature that looked like a chicken today. That it's it's total skeletal the skeletal structures changed. Um, so it is the today's chicken is GMO, you know, but we're doing it through selective breeding and all kinds of other ways of doing it, but you know, um, you know, you'd never again find it. And it's the most ubiquitous bird. So in future generations, they'll be finding chicken bones around the planet going, what, well, how did this bird get everywhere? You know, like, well, who was this bird? You know? Um, you know. The master. master. The master <laughs> bird, yeah. Uh, so, so it is fascinating that, 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 you know, that chicken bones is something that, that is considered you know, that would end up in the sediment and they'd keep flying, oh, chicken bones, Anthropocene, you know, it was, it was us, you know. Um, so it is, it is it, but it, it, we're not really, um, by and large, the Anthropocene Working Group is not l looking at that event of, of, of animals and we're trying to align ourselves as closely to their definitions as possible and, uh, and letting the film be guided by what they're looking at. And, and largely, it's, it's what will go forward millions of years forward. And so anthroturbation tunnels will go forward. So those tunnels will always be there. The cities might, like New York might be a mound with trees growing on it in a million years. And you'd have to dig through a lot of topsoil to all of a sudden get to the towers. But if you got through the towers and all that kind of techno fossils, you would end up in the subway system, which would be largely intact. So, you know, so that's something that goes deep into the future. And again, that's how they're looking at it. So as a geologist in the future, it's, ah, this is now, you know, th these are all the, the rails, and this is all the power, and this is, you know, all the stuff, the tiles of the floor, all there intact. I'm, Ed, I'm just getting the sign from Tatiana, who has to be the cruel one here. Um, uh, we have to get ready for our next tops, so we'll have to stop there. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Fabulous.